Assalamu alaikum, you're watching Just Law. In this program, we discuss legal matters. Um, we have Madiha Dani, who's going to assist us with uh, employment, Islamic wills, and a few other areas, inshallah. Um, viewers, as you know, in this program, you can call in and participate. You can discuss your legal matter. Um, inshallah, so today we'll be concentrating on employment, Islamic wills. Um, if you have any media related questions, you still can ask family and immigration questions, inshallah. But we'll try our best to accommodate all sorts of areas. But the focus today, inshallah, should be um, Islamic wills, employment. Um, if you have any media related questions, you can ask immigration and family as well, inshallah. Um, I have a couple of questions of my own, so I'm going to ask that to the guest. Um, and then, inshallah, the number should come up and you can ask your questions. You can ask your questions um, in English, that's fine. You can ask your questions in Urdu, the guest speaks Urdu. Um, you can ask your questions in Bengali. So if you understand Bengali and you want to ask, it's not a problem, inshallah. Um, if you're an Arabic viewer, inshallah, you can ask in Arabic as well. Um, so, you know, you can call in and participate. Um, first question I have for Madiha. Um, I understand you recently attended uh, an event about, uh, it's to do with Islamic family law about marriage, whether to have a civil registration or not. Mm. Um, a lot of Muslims, they have the Islamic nikah, but they don't necessarily follow through with the civil registration. Um, so can you tell me, what, I mean, what happens? So you have an Islamic marriage and then you have a British marriage? Mm. Well, what happens? Okay, so um, usually um, a person would have the nikah, which is the Islamic marriage, so they'd have it. So this is where you go and have a sheikh, you have two parties, the husband's yeah. party, the wife's party. Mm. So there is an offer and acceptance and yeah. mahar and all, all those kind of things. Yeah. And maybe in the house or maybe at the mosque. Yeah, exactly. Or maybe at a restaurant where they're having the actual event. Mm. Um, so that makes the haram halal, so to speak. Yeah, so that's so what it's makes it necessary. Islamically. Yeah. Okay. So that makes it Islamically a valid marriage if you fulfill okay. all the criteria, as you mentioned. Um, and then there's what's called the civil marriage. So to have it registered in the UK, um, for it to be recognized in the UK as a marriage. So the nikah itself um, is not actually recognized as a marriage uh, in terms of the So it the doesn't UK. entitle you to the, so the legal mm. entitlements, yeah. uh, such as? So for example, um, for exa if, if something happens, obviously, if things don't work out. So in the event of divorce and yeah. financial settlements, yeah. that could have an impact yeah. in terms of having a previous will in terms of making immigration applications. It, could, it affects in everything in terms of well, whether you, you a are lot of married. Things. I yeah, mean, obviously, exactly. if, you, if, you, if you have children, a mm. lot of the Children Act, they don't rely on marriage anymore, mm. um, but it still has an impact. Yeah. It makes a difference, but not a lot when it comes to children. Mm. So it was quite interesting at this debate where they were discussing that 80% of uh, Muslims don't actually have their marriage uh, registered, you know, not, don't so they don't have, have the civil, civil marriage because this is a totally marriage. separate ceremony, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, so they have the nikah, nikah and then they don't actually um, then go, at, you know, usually get it registered at the sort of registry office, uh, the um, local town hall. Yeah, or unless you know certain mosques. I think there's a, like there's the Woking Mosque and there's a few other mosques that actually can do both ceremonies at the you know at the same time, which is quite convenient. So you have the Islamic nikah and the civil ceremony. Exactly. Yeah. So there was um, quite an interesting debate where they were discussing as to whether or not what are the pros and cons of you know, registering the marriage. Um, and you know, th there are a lot of um, reasons why you should, uh, you know, in my opinion as well. Uh, particularly from the lady's perspective. Yeah, yeah. Um, because she may be leaving her home, mm. maybe abandoning her job because mm. she may be pregnant, having a child, etc. Mm. And then after some years to find out that the state will not intervene. Yeah to the extent maybe she wants. Mm. Uh, so if she was married and recognized yeah. by the state, um, she may have a greater role to play mm. in terms of sharing finances, in terms of assets, etc. cetera. Mm. Um, but what about the other side? If you look at it from the man's perspective, um, in Islam, there is already a established way of going separate ways. Yeah. So in the event of talaq, there are things that he has to do to sort of achieve that, if you like. Mm. If there's khula, there's yeah. other requirements. Yeah. So isn't Islamic law enough or where's the problem? I, I guess it is, but it's a matter of whether he's going to then uh, you know, comply with it in some ways. So this is a sort of protection. So this is more to do with enforcement then? 
Because if Islam, if Sharia says he has to give her the yeah. muakhar, the, the remaining mahar, mm -hmm. or if he has to give nafaqa, which is to provide, mm -hmm. if he fails to do that, you can't really engage English law to do that. I mean, the, the thing is, the Sharia doesn't really apply in the UK. So unless you've got the nikah, you know, if you've got the mahar stated in the contract, they'll, they'll accept that because that's a contract. But it's a matter of whether then, you know, the, the, you know, the English courts will then, you know, enforce that. Um, there has been, you know, case law on this where they do. But that's if it's registered, isn't it? If, if the yeah. marriage is, uh, if you have a civil registration, so your marriage is at the town hall, let's say, and you also have an Islamic nikah contract, yeah. and that nikah contract stipulates a an amount that should be paid in the event of divorce, mm -hmm. that almost becomes a bit like a pre nuptial agreement yeah. where there is an agreed amount. Mm -hmm. um, but not having that civil registration. Um, it sort of leaves the way open for the one of the parties not to do anything, and then enforcement becomes difficult. Yeah. But of course, most people are honourable, and they will do what's right. Mm. It's only the small amount or small number of cases yeah. where maybe both parties have not come to the marriage with clean hands. That's when disputes arise. It's only when the disputes happen that you know um, the issue will arise. Um, but it is a way of protecting. Um, especially the woman, as we said, and the children, um, to ensure that it is recognised in the UK, um, and you know, then the children are sort of recognised as the children of you know the father as well, I guess, in some way. Um, since 2006, it's been quite possible to just register his name on the birth certificate, and that, that will accepted. suffice. Yeah. Um, so that's that's not a major concern. Yeah. Um, what is a concern would be the spousal maintenance. Mm. So if she's not considered a spouse, there will be no spouse or maintenance. Yeah. So it's more to do with the financial settlements. But for the woman. Uh, for, for, for yeah, the, I mean, the interesting the thing is that um, marriages, so if you had the nikah in Pakistan, that's actually valid in the UK. So, you know, if it's been, um, you know, because they have it registered there as well when they have the nikah. So that being accepted, um, you know, here, I think also, I think there needs to be a change in the law, really, in some ways, where maybe the nikah itself should be recognised as being a valid marriage. So you don't have to have the, you know, the civil marriage as well, which, you know, it could be argued is slightly contradictory even to the Islamic marriage in terms of... That, that will always remain. I mean, if, yeah. if, if, if the English law decided to accept mm. foreign customary marriages, mm. um, I have no doubt they will throw in a few things that are required. Um, in terms of conflicts, yes, so if Islamic law says the division of assets should be done in a particular manner, English family law may not agree with that. Yeah. Um, but that's going to be there, and the way to fix that would be with a prenuptial agreement. Do you see? So if both parties had legal advice and they decided to adopt the Islamic way of dividing things, mm -hmm. then English law is happy to respect that. Although with the prenups, I know the English law, they're not too keen on having prenuptials and sort of enforcing them. I know there's been some well, issues in the past. Well, my, my particular view on this one is judges always want to get involved where they can. So if there is a prenuptial agreement, and in their view, there is, I wouldn't say injustice, but it's not being equitable. Yeah. They feel one party is being shortchanged. Then they'll find ways to go around and say, well, this prenuptial agreement doesn't envisage you having children doesn't envisage this particular change, yeah. so we're going to deviate and we're it, yeah. going to go out of it and we're going to th do what we feel is more just. Yeah. Um, so judges will always do that, even if you had a watertight uh, prenuptial agreement. Yeah. If they felt that there was something not right, um, there there's always room for them to sort of intervene. Um, but a lot of the times they will give value to the prenuptial because that was the intention of the parties provided it was um, both parties had independent legal advice, they knew what they were doing, they knew what they were getting into, etc. Interestingly, if the lady came to the marriage with a lot of assets and she wanted to preserve it, um, the judges are more inclined to protect that. Yeah. Whereas if the gentleman came to the marriage with a lot of assets and then he had children, etc., it becomes difficult because he's always going to be responsible for the children. For the children. And so it does get complicated. Mm -hmm. And the right and wrong becomes a little bit uh, blurred, if you like. Mm -hmm. um, let's turn to the viewers. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, we have a caller. Can we take the call, please? Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as uh, Can we have your question, brother? 
Yeah, you see, regarding about this, uh, you are speaking. Mm-hmm. It's a family law. Okay. Um, how can we approach you? How can we contact? Because uh, um, here now, you give just briefly <coughs> information. You can't give the full information. Yeah? So, sorry, just repeat that question. Yeah, okay. yeah I say, you're giving the information on the TV now, mm-hmm. alive, yeah? Mm-hmm. So you, you want to find out how can a how so can a, a Muslim male, mm-hmm. you know, before eh? mm-hmm. So how we can contact you? Oh, you want to find out about how to get in touch? Um, inshallah, yeah. I, I will ask the control team to put our email address on screen. No, so, I so. did try your email address. It doesn't work because on email address, if you are on the, uh, YouTube, so it doesn't make any difference. Okay, Th- that's not a problem, brother. If you email us, inshallah, w- and uh, we'll look out for your email, and inshallah, <laughs> after the show, I'll, I'll try to respond to you. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, so, initially, I thought the caller was asking about um, if a gentleman was entering a civil uh, registration. Is there any way they can protect, I mean, apart from having a prenuptial agreement mm-hmm. prior to the marriage? Um, sort of stipulating anything that belonged to the parties prior to the marriage should yeah. remain. Mm-hmm. Um, that's one way of doing it. But like we said, I think later on, if there is a dispute, there is a good degree of involvement from the judges. And if they feel things aren't equitable, they will make changes. Mm-hmm. And there's no way around that, is there, really? Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, that's up to the, the judge, really, on the day. And they think that there's not of justice for the parties and there's children now involved and they're going to, um, you know, they're not going to take the prenup as it is and, and maybe, you know, vary it. I've actually heard of people who transferred their property out to maybe their brother or somebody else, mm-hmm. hoping that if a dispute did arise, yeah. those assets won't form part of the, if you like, the marriage settlement. Mm-hmm. Um, Obviously, that itself has difficulties. What if the brother decides to change his mind yeah. and say, well, thank you very much. I'm going to keep hold of that. Mm-hmm. Or what if the brother gets married and then his yeah. wife says, oh, this belongs to you. Mm-hmm. Um, I think one of the interesting things that was discussed was some people sort of buy properties for their s- children. And then the children grow up. And then the children want to get married. Now there's a difficulty because the child has a property. Yeah that doesn't belong to them. And so if the marriage was to break up, mm. that property may form part of the division. Yeah. And this can, this can be attributed as one of the reasons for the parents not agreeing to a civil registered marriage. Because mm. they're saying, look, you wanted halal, fine. You get a sheikh, you have the Islamic nikah, offer an acceptance in the sight of God in Islam, it's fine. It's valid, yeah. yeah. Um, of, of, you, yeah. As far as I understand, you don't advocate that. Yeah, I mean, um, I think there's, there are pros and cons, um, you know, of, of both sides. And I think one of the other points that people discussed was about polygamy. Um, you know, how does that work? Because um, obviously it's not, it's not allowed in, in the UK, but um, it, in Islam it is. So where When you say polygamy, you're talking about multiple wives, yeah. one husband. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I what? mean, in this country they do allow, but not multiple wives. Well, yeah, it's not, you can't Officially, register, you you know, can't register no two marriages, that's what that, I mean. That's right. So yeah. you can have a wife and maybe something else, and there's Which nothing legally stopping yeah. that person. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. but then you can't register the two, so they're not, we're saying that, you know, you should So you register. cannot have legal arrangement with, with more than two la- uh, one lady. Mm-hmm. Okay, khair. Um, let's turn to the callers. Assalamu alaikum. What's your name? Where Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as I'm a Bengali. 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 Okay, what's your name? I'm a Bengali. 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 Jo has a care allowance apply for to. The Amar question will low, has a care allowance apply for a Amar ESA housing of benefit of Kunu effect to Ibon Yota Tafnez and Panglamar Hunjan. I mean, Buzi Afnar Sele or Hon Kara's allowance Afnar Lagi. I जी बुची बुची तो इतिहास भी किया रहा है लॉन्स लो है ये हमारे बेनिफिट ये से तार हाउसिंग को 
she lives in the house she's unwell um, she has her son who takes care of her she's receiving housing benefits she's receiving other benefits her son wants to apply for carers allowance because he cares for the mother and her question was if he does that would she stand to lose anything so that's the question um, so I'll answer in Bengali and then inshallah I will give a bit of translation in English um protomo to ami apnake bolbo je apne jodi jobs law center ki citizen advice bureau gya zara e is in ishom por ke tarar obhiggota ase tarare apne proshno korbay kintu ami joto tuku jani je apnar sele jodi cares allowance apply kore te cares allowance eta income er moto tara hisab kore kintu apnar kono loss hoar kono khota nai kintu apnar sele je apnar goro takhe ar he holo adult তারা টার্গেটস্টনে হাউজিং বেনিফিট ও কিছু কন্ট্রিবিউশন সাইট তো পারে সম্ভাবনা আছে কিন্তু কেয়ারস অ্যালাউন্স অনেক সময় বেশি পয়সা নয় তে সম্ভাবনা আছে যে তারা না সাইট তো পারে কারণ তার ইনকাম হলো লিমিটেড কিছু নেই কিন্তু আমি এই নম্বর না জানি আর কতটুকু ফাইন কে কি রকম ফাইন কত বেডরুম হাউস আপনার হাউজিং বেনিফিট কত এটা সব না জানি আপনার আমি কইতাম পারতাম না তে আপনি দুই জিনিস করতে পারবেন একটা হলো আপনার সিটিজেন অ্যাডভাইস ব্যুরো কি লো সেন্টারও গিয়ে জিজ্ঞাসা করতে পারবেন তারা আপনার সব হিসাব নিকাস দেখিয়ে বলতে পারবো আর দুই নম্বরে আপনার হাউজিং বেনিফিট লগে আপনি যদি মাথায় সাইন তারাও কিছু হইতে পারবো কিন্তু তারা লিগেল এডভাইস দেওয়ার কথা নাই বাট ইনশাল্লাহ আপনারে তারা কিছু বুঝাইতে পারবো তো সর্বমুঠ হইলো যে আপনার সেলে যদি কেয়ারেস অ্যালাউন্স অ্যাপ্লাই করে তো কিছু সম্ভাবনা আছে যে তার গেস্তনে কন্ট্রিবিউশন এটার মানে হইলো তার গেস্তনে দশ বিশ ফোন হাফটা সাইতেও পারে যেহেতু তার ইনকাম আছে বাট এটাও আমার দৃষ্টিতে না হইতে পারে কারণ এটা হলো লো ইনকাম ওকে আর আপনার যদি প্রশ্ন থাকে তো ইমেলের মাধ্যমে আমরা কাছে লেখ পাই ইনশাল্লাহ আমরা বাংলায় কি ইংলিশে আপনার উত্তর দেব ওকে ভিউজ দি শোর্ট রেসপন্স ওয়াজ দ্যাট কেয়ার্স অ্যালাউন্স ইউজলি ইজ রিগার্ডেড অ্যাজ এ ফর্ম অফ ইনকাম অ্যান্ড দ্যাট বিং দ্য কেস হার সান মে হ্যাভ টু কন্ট্রিবিউট টুওয়ার্ডস দি হাউজিং বেনিফিট সো হি মে বি আস টু পেই টেন টোয়েন্টি থার্টি পাউন্ডস towards the rent um, but this is dependent on his income and the overall calculation um, in this program we can't really give specifics um, so generally speaking if someone is receiving an income that is regarded as an income and the housing benefit may then turn around and say look you have an income you need to contribute towards the rent um, so that's the general advice um, I've said she needs to go to a uh, law center or citizen advice bureau and you know take all her paperwork calculation and inshallah they'll be able to assist you can also write in to us and inshallah we'll have a look and respond and um, please do remember whatever we say in this program um, it is our opinion it is our view on the issue based on the limited information we have um, so I'll turn to Madiha now um, interesting question um, since they introduced the bedroom tax did you hear about that bedroom tax yeah. a lot of people think it's a tax it's not a tax bedroom tax as it's called or it's been named is not actually that the government view was let's say we had people living in a household and they had a spare room yeah. which they did not need why should housing benefit pay for a spare room which they don't need so it was government's way of encouraging people to downsize if they didn't need the extra room So in that sense it makes sense. But if you had an elderly lady living there, her son's grown up, he's gone to study uh, somewhere else, so there is a spare room technically, she doesn't have the money to pay for that room. Yep. And housing benefit won't cover. Mm -hmm. So in a way they've introduced difficulty for her and she may lose the property because she cannot make the additional contribution. Mm -hmm. um, so there's no win, situ you, know, you can't have a situation where everyone wins. Uh, for some people, bedroom tax forces them to downsize, yeah. government pays less, it's all good for the, for the taxpayer. Mm. If you have a situation where you have the spare room but you can't downsize, you don't have income, you end up losing the property. Mm. Um, so it, it's difficult, but yeah. you know, some things are necessary. If you're spending public money, yeah, so you need to justify to, it. Uh, it only applies to someone that is... So the number of rooms, yeah. number of people, mm. if the number of rooms is more than 
what it's supposed to be, then the spare room, the housing benefit will not cover. And so they may end up spending another 20, 30, 50 pounds a week paying for a room which they don't need, but they still have. And sometimes they may not be able to you know, downgrade or take less rooms because the local authority can't provide it. So it's, it's a difficult situation. Yeah. I'm going back to the uh, Mary scenario. Um, earlier on, uh, before the show, you were saying you didn't know anyone who's not married in terms of any one of your sort of circle yeah. who hasn't actually gone for the civil registration. Um, now, let's say for argument's sake, somebody was getting to know somebody and then they were thinking, right, I'll do the Islamic nikah, so it's all halal, so we can do certain things without feeling guilty. Um, and then civil registration would follow. Mm. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that, right? There isn't, yes. But um, I think one of the, the, the thing about the marriage is that there should be some sort of commitment you know, into entering the marriage. Um, and so if you're going in thinking, I'm just going to try it out, I, I don't really think that's quite right. You know? But there's always a position, isn't there, that you go in, you, ha you, you know, you have a sort of, you meet the person, you meet the family. There's always a, what I call the transient position. Um, and even if you've done the Islamic nikah, and if you had the ceremony and everything, that's when you really get to know the person, isn't it? I mean, you can't really know a person. It's like trying to get to know a fish outside the waters. You're not going to. Um, and also, Islamically, you don't need to have the civil registration. No, you don't. So why have it? Apart from the financial aspect for the lady. Well, it, yeah, yeah, and for it and to be obviously recognised. By the state for, right. say, immigration purposes. Yeah. Actually, that's an interesting uh, position. Uh, viewers, if you are in an arrangement where you've done the Islamic nikah, but you haven't registered your marriage, um, and you have sort of reasons, um, general reasons, that you would like to share with us, inshallah. Uh, I'd like to hear from the brothers. I'd like to hear from the sisters, if I may. Um, so as to, you know, what were your reasons for not going forward and having the civil registration? And if you had the civil registration, um, you know, is it a positive thing? Was there, was there some sort of hindrance? Did it have an impact? Um, because my understanding is, if you have the Islamic uh, nikah, then that's your commitment to God, that's your commitment to society, that's your commitment to the, to the other party. It's, it's done. Now, whether um, that's enough or not, it's for the parties to decide. Uh, let's quickly turn to the phone line. Salaamu Alaikum, what's your name, where are you calling from? Hello, Salaamu Alaikum. Wa Alaikum uh, Sir, uh, can I speak in Urdu, is it okay? Um, you can speak in Urdu. Yep. Yeah. My problem is that I have a family member visa. I have a European wife. Mm -hmm. Hello? Hey, continue, brother. I can't hear very well. Hello? Continue. Uh, so, Oske Saat already Mere Shadike Bath in Sal Hoge, making a be Masla Yewe, Kevo, Apes Televi, Apne country. Making mm -hmm. Mere Smolk me, uh, Art Sal no Mine Hoge. So, December Doza Sola me Mere the Sal Purione Wale. Mm -hmm. So, Kia me eligible Hunga, uh, December Doza Sola me Agamestra continue Raku. December 2016, okay, okay, brother, we've understood your question. Inshallah, we'll, we'll answer it, okay? Uh -huh. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah. Right, so Madiha, the, the question is, um, he's already been married uh, to a European for three years. Okay. Um, and his overall is going to be 10 years in the UK yeah. in December. Mm -hmm. So his question is, um, should he apply for indefinite based on the 10-year law for residence right. uh, or what should he do? So I'll answer that in English and then you can maybe just say some things in Urdu. Okay, uh, brother, the simple answer is if you have joined the European route, the best option is to take, you've been married for more than three years. If you are divorced, on the date of divorce, was the wife working or was she exercising treaty rights? If she was, then you need to prove, one, that you had a genuine relationship with her, so it lasted the three years. Two, on the date of divorce that she was exercising treaty rights, so working, etc. Three, that post-divorce that you are now self-sufficient, you're working or running a business, etc. Um, inshallah, if you can provide all that, you can apply under the European retained rights provisions. You understood that? Yeah. 
so uh, to apply so the evidence e that the three year relationship yeah. lasted evidence that during this period the wife was working or running out uh, and then on the date of divorce yeah. she was still exercising treaty rights so has there been a divorce in this case or? he has he has not mentioned it but okay. i'm just saying that's what it is and then um that he's continued to have you know independent income or he's working if there's not been a divorce then that's something he needs to look at doing okay. in terms of the indefinite leave to remain route um, he would have to prove that she was exercising treaty rights or else even the indefinite would fail. But when he's making the application for the EU, it's still for indefinite? Well, they call it permanent residency and that's okay, probably easier to do than the 10-year lawful residence. So, you can apply for permanent residency for three years. You can apply for three years. If you have a divorce, you have to give evidence when you have to give your application that it was your genuine marriage when you had to give your wife. And your wife, on the date when she was divorced, that she was working or she was studying or she was doing some business. Um, and also, you have to show that you are also working or also studying or any business you have. So, so, yeah. so, so exercising treaty rights. So uh, this is the this is the best way to do this as opposed to the 10 years of uh, indefinite leave which you can apply for your application. So, uh, the difficulty yeah. with that is they will ask for the same evidence to give him the 10 year lawful. So why do you think that you want is uh, Well, the 10 year indefinite route will, uh, the fee is over a thousand pounds. And also they don't like it when you mix the European and the domestic. Okay. Um, so that's where there's a difficulty. Okay. And if, if they say, oh, you've not exercised treaty rights or this and that, even the 10 year would fail or likely to fail. Mm -hmm. um, the best answer is to go to somebody local mm -hmm. and have all his evidence checked out, what's available, what's not available, and then decide on an option. Um, but since he's been here for 10 years, he's been married, if there's any children which he hasn't disclosed, mm -hmm. or if there's um, you know, other things, inshallah, he should succeed. Yeah. Um, so if you can talk to your local solicitor, you can take all your paperwork, then you can tell you which option will be good for you. Or you know, if you have enough evidence or more evidence, then you can take your advice. Okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, viewers, you are watching Just Law, and we are discussing legal matters. Um, today we discussed about family law, whether to register or rather have a civil uh, marriage ceremony or not, or just the Islamic nikah. We had interesting perspectives. I'd like you to sort of participate after the break and maybe put your views as well. Um, you can also call in about uh, immigration matters, as some of the viewers have done. You can ask your question in Bengali, as the First Lady did. You can ask your question in Urdu. You can ask in English. You can also write in to us. Uh, so we're going for a break, inshallah. So we'll see you after the break. Stay tuned to Ikra. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.